revealed to me, I think when I was an, uh, a college student, somebody recommended a pattern of reading that you would read five psalms a day uh, and one chapter in the book of Proverbs, and then every month you would cycle your way through the book of Psalms and Proverbs. And while I'm very excited and encouraged to have anybody read their Bibles, i uh, love to have people do that, uh, it's actually a very bad way to read Psalms and Proverbs. Uh, and the reason I say that is because as you enter into, uh, and this is one thing, we're coming to a kind of literature in, in the Bible that's not easy to read for most people, right? That's why when you were going through school, most of us, we don't look back on like our 7th and 8th grade or ninth grade years, if somebody recalls them for us, and we remember fondly reading poetry, right? Uh, or having uh, composing poetry. And when you even ask people who writes poems, that's a decided minority of people who do that. And so even though probably our, 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 in our contemporary environment, the pr most uh, prominent place that you find poetry is in our songs. And some of it's very bad poetry, right? Uh, but that's the kind of poetic expression that we're used to where it's kind of put to song. Sometimes it can be very well done, but often uh, it's not very well done uh, in terms of that. Uh, and poetry demands a lot of the reader because poetry is full of all kinds of dense imagery and metaphors and conflicting images and, and indirect statements that just takes you some time to set on it. And I, I say this to you because we're in an environment where our attention spans, just as being measured, are shrinking. And we're visually oriented to images. And even now, if you have a commercial, you may have hundreds of images in a commercial just in a 30-second span. And that's why, in terms of videos now, if you're on a YouTube video and it goes for longer than like five minutes, you're like, come on, right? Can you not build this house already, right? It's like five minutes in. Right? Can you not build the house already? So we're, we're in that kind of thing. And to have something that you just linger over, something that you read and reread and you hang in until you can explain it to yourself, that's not a discipline that we're used to. And so I'd like to encourage you, right, as you do this, to, to linger over them. One of the things that I, that I do that I, I find helpful for me, and I'll, I'll just give you some ideas, uh, many of you know BibleGateway.com. It's, it's a common, everybody can get access to it. One of the things that I did on the way back yesterday from South Carolina, uh, I did it safely just in case people are listening here, but it has, it has on the app itself, you, it has an audio thing where you can play the audio and have a nice, very well-spoken person read you the psalm. And I think yesterday I probably had that person read me the psalm like 10 times yesterday. And each time was a different sort of experience. And in addition, when you think about this, these psalms were intended to be sung, right? They were actual songs that were intended to be sung by the people who were there. And it's a testimony that he has put to poetry. And so it is something that demands a little bit of us and often we don't. This psalm, Psalm 73, and uh, along this, is one of the psalms that has put a marker on my life. And some of you, uh, if you have a favorite psalm or a favorite verse, Psalm 73 is one of those. And it can an important moment in my life when I was in college, Psalm 73 was an important psalm. I kind of stepped into the experience of the psalmist uh, and felt the weight of the despair that he felt and felt the encouragement to climb out of that despair with his help. So the Psalm 73 has been around in my life for a long time. I've returned to it often, and it's also been a psalm that I've recommended to other people in times of difficulty. It's a place where I want them to go and set with the psalm, reflect on it, write on it, identify with it, right? One of the things that the psalmist is assuming here is that his experience, and the reason it's recorded here, is his experience is a general, typical experience of followers of God. This is not unusual. This is typical. Matter of fact, as we look through the, the scriptures, if you go to Jeremiah chapter 12 or even to Psalm uh, 49 or you go to Habakkuk the prophet chapter 1, all of them are wrestling with the same question. And matter of fact, the book of Job is wrestling with this question through the whole book. 
And the issue that we come here is why, is the psalm, why do the wicked, and the wicked here are the people who reject God. They reject his norms, they reject his presence, they reject his demands, they reject his goodness, they reject the necessity that they have to listen to him, to pay attention to him. The wicked are the ones who shut God out of their life. And the question is, why do these people prosper? And this is a perennial question among God's people, right? I've kept all the rules. I went to church and I got cancer. And that person who just defies you, who rejects you, who just arrogantly talks about their sin and wickedness, right? They're happy, they're popular, they're fat. That's a biblical terminology which didn't have a negative connotation the way it has today, right? Um, uh, I think I've shared with you before when we were in Togo, uh, uh, one of the things that will often be said to commend a wife's husband uh, is to say that, that you're nice and fat, right, to the woman, meaning that your husband is taking good care of you. That doesn't sound very good to Western women when somebody says that, right? Uh, but the idea that you're prospering, that you're doing well, that you've got plenty to eat, that, that you have all the markers of wealth and flourishing, right? But why, why has this happened, right? To put it this way, what's the use, and this is what Asaph uh, who this is attributed to, what's the use of following the way of life God has called us to when those who reject him are healthy, wealthy, and popular, and we are sick, poor, and here I'm going to use a phrase from Paul, remember Paul's phrase, and we're the scum of the earth. We're the scum of the earth. Is God just? Can he be just and these things be happening? Is he there? Does he even care or pay attention, right? Matter of fact, we're going to get uh, the wicked person that's going to be personified here. He's going to reflect and think, I don't even think God pays attention because over against what the, the pure in heart, the people who are following God are saying, well, he's not obeying any of those strictures and he's doing just great. So either your God isn't there or he doesn't care, right? He doesn't even look. He's not involved in terms of what's going on. So he confronts this question, and if you look at the psalm and you're trying to chart it, right, you can, in, in the emotions of the psalm, and this is the thing here, in the emotions, the first half of the psalm is literally a free fall. It's an emotional free fall. And so he begins to look around, if you will, and he has a view from below. We'll come back to that. He begins to look around. He sees all these inequities, and his life is in the crapper, right? And everything is going great for them, and it's just an emotional free fall, and he just goes down and just hits rock bottom in despair, and he, t and he says, I've followed God for nothing. It's useless. It's been empty. I'd have followed him for nothing. Well, then when he hits bottom, Something happens, there's a stop, there's something that keeps him from bottoming all the way out, from turning this back on God altogether, and we'll talk about that. And he begins an ascent, the rest of the psalm is an ascent back up. And so he begins, though, with where he's going to end. So look at verse 1 with me, and let's get started as we walk our way through. This is something you often find in the psalms, is where they will put the conclusion of the psalm, the moral of the story, at the beginning and end of the psalm. It's just a sandwich. They put the two pieces of bread on each end, and then they put the journey to get to that, that end in between. And so this, this psalm is actually, it's, it's called an inclusio framework. It's just a framework where you have two pieces of bread and a, and, and a meat in between. And so here's how the psalm begins. Surely... God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart, okay? Now, read, follow down, go to the end of the psalm, and this is where he ends with his conclusion. Those who are far from you, verse 27, those who are far from you will perish. You destroy all who are unfaithful to you, but as for me, it is good to be near God. I have made the sovereign Lord my refuge. I will tell of your deeds, now, that last phrase, I will tell of your deeds, he has fulfilled that promise by writing the psalm because the psalm is telling of the deeds of the Lord that helped him recover from this despair, right? So, the lesson is at both ends. He begins with the, the beginning point. This is why you need to understand there's not a real, uh, contextually, you, you move from verse 1 to verse 2 and it's, it's a jar, 
right? Surely God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost slipped. And so he moves from you know, like affirmation of God's goodness, and then it seems like, well, wait a minute, what happened to you? Right? Well, he's beginning with the conclusion. And I want to say a couple things here when you think about God's goodness, right? His opening affirmation. To say that God is good is that God always acts consistent with his character. God is the definition of goodness. And for him to act consistent with his character means because of his goodness is that he'll always act for our protection, for our growth, and our joy. Right? God is always acting consistently through Scripture. We're trusting that God is always for us. Our growth, our protection, our growth, and our joy. And here we have to say clearly that God allows evil in the world. There's nothing in Scripture that tries to explain away evil. No, God allows evil in the world, but God allows evil either to promote a greater good or to avert a greater evil. To promote a greater good or to avert a greater evil. And also, always, God's goodness has to be looked at over the long term. Right? This is something that's looked over uh, the whole of life, even into eternity. One of the things that separates Christians from everyone else is that we're making decisions based on how they will play out after this life. You find me? Follow me? We're making decisions based on how they will play out after this life. One of my, one of my, uh, 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 one of my favorite novels is Jane Eyre. Jane Eyre is a, is a novel, it's a tragic love story, but it's also a, a story of a, a, a girl who grows into adulthood, but also grows in virtue and, and is committed to serve God. And she gets in this situation, it's a long story, we'll come back to it, but she gets in this situation where this Lord of the Manor, and here she's this orphan girl, and this Lord of the Manor, it's like all the circumstances have worked out, she's going to get married to this guy, but it just one thing is wrong, he's already married. His wife is crazy. She's in a difficult situation. He's been absent a wife for years and years now, and his, his idea is, I deserve, I deserve some happiness in my life. I deserve these things, and so let's just go for it, Jane. Let's just go after it. Let's just get, and why don't you just become my mistress? And Jane steps in there and says, no, because she's making decisions on how they will play out after this life. And she has every reason as an orphan girl, as someone who's on the bottom rungs, as somebody to be brought up into a life of luxury and power. She has all the reasons, humanly speaking, to want to take that offer, but she says no, because she has long-term vision, right? So we want to talk about that, and the psalmist is trying to get us there. The psalmist is not going to say that if you're following God and doing all the right things, you'll never get sick. The psalmist is not going to say that if you're following God and you're doing what he wants you to do, that you won't be treated unjustly. He's not going to say that. All over the world today, there are people who are following Jesus today and they are being hated and punished. So the psalmist is not Pollyannish and nor is he pessimistic. He's realistic about the nature of the world and he wants to take us into it. So God's always at work for the good, and his goodness is spelled out always in his created intentions and in his actions, right? So one of the things that the psalmist is always going to do, and the psalm, they're always going to remember, they're always going to step out from the moment and think about God, his character, and his actions. But God is good, and that's the fundamental one, but his goodness is experienced by the pure in heart. Okay, so who are the pure in heart? Well, the pure in heart is the idea, not so much, it's not that they're sinless, it's that they have this complete devotion to God. It's not mixed with any other kind of loyalties. It's the kind of thing that every wife wants their, their, from their husband, right? I only have eyes for you, right? And this is the pure and hardest. I, I don't have any other idols. I don't have any other thing that I look to. Matter of fact, he's going to speak as a pure and heart. He says, whom do I have in heaven but you? Whom do I have on earth? No one besides you. So in his vision, the pure in heart is someone who, right, let's use the New Testament language, you love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, right, taken from Deuteronomy, right, Jesus repeats that. So the pure in heart is someone who has an unalloyed commitment to God, and so they trust him even in the face of dark moments as we were singing. 
So he, that's his affirmation. Truly, God is good, right? And we need to understand it on God's terms to those who trust in him. Okay, now let's move in. Here's his descent into doubt. That's your first blank if you're filling those in. The first one in, in verses 2 through 14, he descends into doubt. Okay? So the lights start going off, right? I don't know if you've been in a moment where uh, I've, I've realized about myself, uh, I struggle with anger. I don't know if anybody struggles with anger, but I struggle with anger. And I, I have a moment where uh, when something happens, I can flare up, and if I don't act right away, then it becomes a fire that just starts burning and holds there for a while. And especially when, when we were first married, even though my wife is absolutely perfect uh, and does everything right all the time, I would get aggravated with her, and what would happen to me, I wouldn't lash out, but I would just go in, and it would be like this fire that's burning down in here. And I would have to, it would get there and I'd let it take hold and then I'd have to go run or do something to work it out, right? But it would, it would flare up and consume me. And the thing that happened is, 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 is as, the, as the anger started to boil over, it's like all the lights started going out and I got consumed by that feeling of anger, right? So I noticed this the other day, I was driving uh, down in South Carolina and I was giving thanks to the Lord for this uh, saving me from this descent into anger, right? Turning all the lights out. Uh, I had a guy who was tailgating me, right? Irritated the snot out of me, tailgating me uh, in a car that looked like if he pressed the gas, it would fall apart on the road. And he was tailgating me right up behind. And I'm a guy from Ohio, right down in South Carolina. So that was probably irritating him, number one, like this guy doesn't know where he's going. Uh, and he's riding right up on the behind, and I'm turning on this new road that I don't know, and here it's a through, like, yield, and you go around, and I'm thinking, I'm kind of going tentatively, and he's back there beeping his horn right at me and this kind of stuff like that. And then as soon as I get, he gets enough space, he zips up beside me, and, you know, right over in front of me, right? Just like, you know, uh, and something, uh, uh, not a good gesture made in my direction. And so that happened, and at the moment, at the moment like that, I felt it. I felt it start to go. Right? I felt it start to go, and in that moment, I said, okay, by God's grace, I said, no, I'm not going to go there. Why am I going to let this guy get me all riled up? Right? I was a little bit tentative. I'm sure he's irritated. He was late, and God saved me from going in there. But you know yourself, if you let anger take over, you take lust, it's like you're in a room where the lights are on, and all of a sudden, the lights just start turning off. And pretty soon, you're just in the darkness of your anger. You're in the darkness of your lust. You're in the darkness of your fear. You're in the darkness of whatever it is. It's just like the lights all go off, and all of a sudden, you feel like you're consumed by it. And so here's, here's how he starts descending into it. So what happens? Let's read it. But as for me, verse 2, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the arrogant when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek. They are not in trouble as others are. They are not stricken like the rest of mankind. Therefore, pride is their necklace. Violence covers them as a garment. Their eyes swell out through fatness. Their hearts overflow with follies. They scoff and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues strut through the earth. Therefore, his people turn, turn back to them and find no fault in them. And they say, how can God know? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked. Always at ease, they increase in riches. All in vain have I kept my heart clean and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long, I have been stricken and rebuked every morning. Okay. Now, he's honestly portraying right? His feelings, right? And sometimes, let me just say this about this. Um, sometimes when we go to God in prayer, we try to say things to him that are not true of the state of our heart. And sometimes when we recount experiences to each other, we don't own the fact that we had stepped into the darkness we just go straight to the story that God overcame it, and we don't identify and sometimes discourage other people from thinking that, you know, I don't struggle with ever going into the darkness like you do. And there's been a moment, if you've taken seriously a reversal in your life, if you haven't had them, 
right? Then you may live beyond them and not think about them. Uh, I remember when I was in seminary, I had this naivete about the joy of, re of reading and studying the scriptures. And uh, a professor said, you know, sometimes just studying the Bible is just labor. It's just hard work. And I piped up with a just good Pollyanna answer and said, oh, but Dr. So-and-so, isn't it a delight to study the word of God? And he said, well, yes, Greg, it is, but sometimes it's just hard work against the darkness in your own soul. I thought, that didn't sound very spiritual right at that moment. And sometimes if you're sitting at the bedside of somebody who's facing a, a diagnosis or who's facing a tragedy or who's looking at a family situation that seems to be just absolutely complex and, and, and no way out of it, or a, a husband or a wife that you've been trying to love and those kinds of things, and it feels like I've been doing all the right things. Is he ever going to respond? Is this ever going to change? Right, those kinds of things. And in those moments, it is human, right? You can, the lights start going out, you lose sight of God and what's going on, and pretty soon you're caught up in that. I'm not calling us to all say that, yes, we're bad people. I know we're all bad people. I'm not calling us to give experiences that we haven't had. I'm calling us that if, you, if you're sitting on the outside of tragedy because it's never really visited your life, that tragedy is a part of living in the fallen world. And if you love people, you will be drawn into their tragedy. If you love them, you will identify with that and you will weep with those who weep. And either they will be weeping with you at times or you'll be weeping with them. Right? And so this is what he does. So here's the trip in the fall. He was deceived... Right? By the apparent, key, apparent prosperity of the wicked, verses 2 and 3. Right? So the, he's near a, a near faith collapse. Right? He tells he really almost stumbled. For him, that would be to abandon God and to trust in some other God. Right? And we've talked about this when we were in James. We're not wired as human beings to, to live under the pressure of fallen, broken world without God's help. We're not, we're not made to. And so if you've got difficulties at home, difficulties in relationship, difficulties at the job, if you're struggling with sin in your own life, you need help. And, and you will run somewhere to get help. And when he says slipped and fall, that means, well, I left and abandoned God and I went to some other false savior to try to deliver me. So if you're in distress as a Christian, you will go somewhere, right? Drugs, alcohol, pornography, right? Uh, distractions, Right, you'll go somewhere to get out from under the pressure, right, into a bad relationship, someone who can kind of assuage you in that because at least you've got somebody who cares for you, something is visceral and real right now. You know, all kinds of different ways you'll go after it, right, to get there. So that's what happened. You'll get there. And so he almost fell. He almost fell. And he's going to take us down the path of what led him there. So, uh, so he almost fell out with God, though he was walking the path laid out for God and his people, what he experienced almost knocked him out, right? So even as he tells us the reason for his near collapse, he speaks from the point of view of his recovery, okay? Now, I want you to get this here. He's speaking from the point of view of his recovery. If we were to write this in terms of what he looked at when he was looking at them, uh, he was looking at, he wouldn't have called them wicked, right? He, would, he envied them. They're the envied people, not the empty people, not the purposeless people, not the people who are missing out on life. No, they're the people who are really getting it. And this is the thing here, is he's getting swept into it. You know, one of the things that's been revealed on and on and again is the world of Instagram, right? To give you an example of it, okay? The, the stats and things, especially with, with young women, right? Uh, co high school, college age women, is that Instagram itself has been a, just a, an addictive, attractive environment. As a matter of fact, when it came out about the idea of the research that they have on how it's built in order to keep you engaged, and also on the fallout emotionally on women in particular, as they're constantly comparing themselves with the Instagram-worthy bodies and the Instagram beautiful lives and the Instagram experiences lived around the globe, you're constantly in a situation where you're dealing with envy. You're constantly dealing with envy. And when you're looking at that, it becomes more and more attractive. I'd love to be at that place with that beautiful clear water with that good-looking guy. I'd like to have that draped on my arm too, right? I'd like to be uh, this kind of person where everybody tunes in just to pay attention to my life and look at me and wear what I wear. 
All that kind of thing like that. So it becomes, and so he's given the perspective from his recovery where he's looking at a near collapse, but at the point that he was moving into the collapse, he didn't necessarily feel he was collapsing. He was being attracted to something and being distracted from the goodness of God. So he begins to fall in here. And so what happens? The comparison in verses 4 through 14. So here another blanks to fill in. The so-called evidence of their prosperity, a comparison between Asaph and the wicked from below. Between uh, comparison with Asaph and the wicked from below. Now he begins to look at the lives of these people. So it's a limited vision, right? He's looking. He can't see the long haul. He can't see into the hearts and minds of these people. All he can see is these outward markers, right? And so one of the things that, that the evil one wants to do is make you think that the markers of success are things that can be seen. They can be seen by the number of followers on social media. They can be seen by the amount of popularity that you have. They can be seen by the good compliments that you get. They can be seen by the amount of money that people are willing to spend on you or send to you, right? By how much power that you have. That's the whole idea. And those are the things that can be seen. But so he's got a vision from below. He's not informed by God's purposes and character. He's not informed by God's sense of justice at all. He's just looking at what he sees on the ground. And here's what he sees, right, uh, in verses 4 to 12. The wicked are carefree. It's one of your uh, uh, blanks there. The wicked are carefree, carefree and wealthy. So they're free from life's struggles and free of concern about heavenly constraints, right? So they're, they're carefree and wealthy. He says they have no pangs until death. Their bodies are fat and sleek, right? It's not only that they're super healthy, right? They look good. They're the kind of body that you envy, Right? You think of how many people right now are living large on the fact that they have a body that they can monetize. Their abs are promoting a lot of people to try to get their abs. Right? Their looks are promoting a lot of people wanting to get their fitness. Now, those are not all bad. I'm not saying that they are bad. But the issue is here is they seem to be healthy and well. But they don't have God on their lips. They don't care about him. They don't talk about him. They don't care about his constraints. Their lives aren't shaped by that. And so the idea here is it ends in verse 7, their eyes swell out through fatness and their hearts overflow with follies, right? And there's an irony here to this, right? They're so fat, right, in some ways, it's like their eyes are closing, okay? Now, uh, I don't know if you've seen a little baby like that. It's cute, a little baby, right? See a little baby that's a pudge ball mm, down here and they got little squinty eyes they can barely see out. But behind this is... Their, their fatness has dulled their spiritual vision. They can't see. Their prosperity has been a curse to them. Now, this is, this is one of the, the ironies of life. You remember when Paul says, um, I've learned how to both be abased and how to abound. And what he means, I've learned how to follow Jesus, trust Jesus, look to Jesus, walk with Jesus, whether life is going really badly or whether life is going really well. And one of the things that you know about yourself as a Christian is some of the most spiritually dangerous moments is when life is going really well. And you think you're doing okay, you don't need God's help, things are going great, and things are going great, and all of a sudden you're there. Well, especially this is why Jesus will often say as you're reading through the Gospels, who is it most difficult to get into the kingdom of heaven? It's the rich, it's the wealthy, because they've got all of the things that are kind of mitigating the effects of the fall. They've got protection and food and security, and they can enjoy all these luxuries. And all of a sudden, they look back and look at their own selves and look what I've done, look what I've made, look at the storehouses that I've filled. And they think that they're self-sufficient, and that can happen to Christians too. So they're... they're they're doing well, but their eyes are almost swollen shut. They can't really see life. They scoff, verse 8, and speak with malice. Loftily, they threaten oppression. They are openly, blatantly defiant. They're contemptuous of the norms that God sets out. Right? We live in a society that is the contemptuous of God's sexual norms. They're, it's not just that, that, that people don't that think that they're just one way that you can live. No, no, they're an actually oppressive way to live. They're actually something bad and wrong 
for you to keep your sexual appetites within the bounds that God has set within marriage, then, then you're living an oppressed life. You're denying your authentic self. So the boundaries there, they're contemptuous of them, and they speak maliciously of people who adopt them. And this is that Jesus' life tells us, you don't have to be a rude, irritating, ignorant person to be disliked. Now, you will be if you're that kind of person, but all you have to be to be disliked in this world is to tell the truth, to live the truth, to embrace it. So the idea, they scoff and they, they threaten oppression, right? They set their mouths against the heavens and their tongues strut through the earth. They lay claim to heaven. The effect is if they're speaking as if they are God themselves, right? And this is one of the things that happen. If you get to a position of authority and power in the secular world, then everybody wants to hear your advice on how did you make so much money? How did you become so popular? How did you become so powerful, right? Give me the secret. And then you sell your books and you go give your speeches and you go do those things and you become the key, right, for people's life. And you speak as if you can rewrite the nature of human existence, and you can tell men and women how to flourish. You can tell them what love is really about. You can tell them how to live, right? And that's where we live in the culture in which we live today and in so many different places. So therefore, his people turn back to them and find no fault in them, right? This is actually one of the most difficult verses in here to translate exactly what's being said. You read four commentaries, you'll get four different perspectives on it in terms of this one. But the point seems to be is that People buy into it and follow them, right? They're popular, right? Using one of our contemporary phrases, people think that they're on the right side of history. So I'm in with you. And they've got popularity, and they're drinking it up. But the imagery here is kind of double-fold, is that it's also they drink up this stuff and it drowns them. It robs them of life. And so here's what they say. How can God know? Is there no knowledge? Is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the wicked, always at ease. They increase in riches, right? So they're contemptuous of God's attention and contemptuous of his presence, okay? I was sharing this with uh, um, the group in the back as we uh, were getting started today. One of the things that, that I have been praying for myself, especially over this, these last couple months in particular, I'm just praying and asking God to help me be aware of his presence, you know, we, we, we are attuned to um, believe, we, we're always looking for, we can be, as the children of Israel, always looking for God to do something dramatic to demonstrate that he's there. We, we sometimes want to put him to the test in a situation and say, God, if you're really there, you'll do X. And all of those things are so dishonoring to God because as God portrays him himself in Scripture, the reason you live and move and have your very existence is because God is sustaining you today. Your days are in his hands. When he decides, your life will be over. Not when something happens, when he decides. The psalmists will tell us we need to learn to number our days. God is the one who has life and death in his hand. God is the one who sustains the very world in which we live. God is the one who enables our brains to function. He enables me. I was thinking of it today. I was praying, Lord, you today are determining the degree to which I have my mental faculties today. One day in his providence, he can make it so that I don't have them. The mobility that I have, the access that I have, the, 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 the depth that I have with my own wife and our relationship together, all those things are gifts of his goodness. He sustains life in every moment. Little baby Hunt is God's mercy. All those things are his presence. And so I want to be aware of that and, and here. And so here is the doubt God's not even there. Well, then what happens? Asaph, right? On the other hand, verses 13 and 14. Two terms. He's punished and plagued, right? Now notice there's no light for Asaph. I don't know if you've ever gotten to the point where you say everything's bad, right? It's a no good, very bad, horrible, no good day, right? You had one of those where everything is wrong and, and everything is bad and you can't see anything good going on and you even get irritated with people to try to say, well, wait a minute, and you say, shut up, right? One of those moments, well, Asaph, he's just, he's just completely gone dark. All, all in vain have I kept my heart and washed my hands in innocence for all day long I've been stricken and rebuked every morning right? So every day he can't get out of this. 
All he does is think about it all the time. And I, I don't know if you've ever had some reversal happen to you, right? Like a friend really abandoned you and hurt you. It takes enablement from God to get your mind out of dwelling on that all the time. If you were in a home, I'll give you this one example that comes up over and over again. If you were in a home and your parents divorced and one of your parents abandoned you, often happens with the treat dad, and they abandon you. That sense of abandonment is something that doesn't go away when you get 25 or 30 or 45. And the evil one will want to take you back into that despair. And life will happen, right? That's why they often speak about the dad who disappears or the non-custodial parent who disappears is like the death of a parent. But the sad thing is it's a death that just keeps giving. So you graduate from high school, he's not there. You get married, he's not there. You have your first kid, he's not there. You go here, he's not there. And then every time you get a mind, and the, the thoughts that go through, and these are well documented, go through, what was wrong with me that my dad would abandon me? Did I cause it? Did I do these things? All, no, 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 no. Right? But those are the kinds of things, and if you've ever gone through a reversal, you've experienced something like that, you will be taken back into that at different points in your life. Those key moments will take you back there, and God will need to be revisited again and again. And all of a sudden, your life is going well, and you'll be drawn back into your past, and the lights will go out. And that's what Asaph has fun to. But what happens here? Here's the break in the fall, verse 15. He takes responsibility. If I had said I would speak thus, I would have betrayed the generation of your children. Okay? So he's been focusing on this injustice, but all of a sudden what stops him? What stops him is his connections to other people. Right? And we're going to talk about this on the way out. Asaph had done some things to put him in a situation where he had some safety nets to save him when he lost his mind. Okay? So this is, this is the kind of thing here. If you've got a struggle, this is often true of men if they struggle with pornography, right? You've got to go at the heart. You've got to go at uh, what, what's attracting you to this debauchery, to this ugliness. You've got to go after it. And you've got to see it differently as sin. You've got to see it as something as darkness. You've got to look at the, the, the wonders of God and pursue Him. But anybody who struggled with it, you put in safety nets because there'll be moments when you're weak. Right? And so what do you do? You get enmeshed in a community of people. You let them know about your struggle. You become aware of people that you trust. And so sometimes when you get in the point where you're just about ready to give up, you remember the people in your life who have brought God to you and represented God to you. And they become like the safety net that keeps you from bottoming out. Right? But Asaph, if he didn't have those kind of connections, there'd be no bottom out. Right? So something that Asaph did, and we're going to come back to this about what faith does, is putting in structures in your life to, to be ready for those inevitable reversals because they will happen. If it hasn't happened today, it's going to happen tomorrow. If it's not going to happen tomorrow, it's going to happen the next day where you're going to be doing all the right things and then boom, it's going to happen this way, right? So this is the kind of thing that he's done. So he it's responsibility. He said, I can't, I can't say this. I I'm at least need to think about the damage that I would do if I just went and blurted it out everywhere, Right? And if we don't have a, a culture at the moment that's a blurt out culture, everybody just blurts out everything. Okay? Now here, Asaph is thinking, I need to steward my struggle. Have you ever thought about that? Now, if you're a, you're a parent, right, you've thought about this well where you've had struggles, and if, you were, uh, if your parents were good parents, one of the things that parents do is they often bear the weight of darkness and they don't give it to the kids. They, they got struggles going on in families that are there. They got struggles going across the street. They've got struggles that are going on in their family. But they don't come home and talk about grandma being an idiot all the time with their kids. Right? They don't come home and talk about how so-and-so isn't treating his wife. Well. Why? Because they can't understand it. They don't know how to process it. It's a weight that they shouldn't bear. Right? So wisdom says, no, wait a minute. I can't say that because I would hurt other people. I need to think about this. And my first recourse is to go to God about it, to go to Him about it. 
So then he's honest, verse 16 and 17. But when I thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task until I went into the sanctuary of God. Then I discerned therein. So this is a turning point, right? He couldn't, he, one of the key things here is he recognized, I can't figure this out on my own. And so he's got to, he needs help. And that's the key thing. He needs help. And so where does he go? He runs to God with his disappointment. He runs to God with his sense of being abandoned. He goes there to him for help, right? So he runs to him in this moment, and so he's honest with his self, okay? And this is something here where um, this is hard for us in so many different ways. And let me just relate this to you in this way. If you're a follower of Jesus, you still sin. Okay? And if that, that bothers you, you just need to sit on it for a while. Right? You are saved, and God has begun a renovation project in you, but it won't be complete until you see Him. You still struggle with selfishness. You struggle with pride. You struggle with lust. You struggle with, with being lazy and detached from the things of God. You struggle with letting your appetites get out of order. Every Christian struggles with all those things, right? And because you are struggling, everybody in here has blind spots. Everybody has things that the people in your life know. Sometimes they joke with you about them. Sometimes they make fun of them. Sometimes they try to lovingly point those out to you. Some of it that you're overly anxious about everything. Some of you, you're fearful. Some you get easily angered. Some, you get obsessed with details and you forget that there are actually people around those details, right? All those things that happen, th those are our blind spots and it's just a part of being this side. And we have a hard time owning the fact that, yeah, I do have blind spots and being honest about it. And also in our confession, we have a really hard time going and saying, you know, God, today I just lied. That just sounds too harsh. You know, God, I, that was lust. That was lust. That's just what happened in my soul. And I, I reduced that woman to an object. I was unfaithful to my wife and looking at her that way. That's what happened just then. And that kind of honesty is where we're dealing because we don't get healing from these. We don't deal with the darkness in our souls by being dishonest. He knows that God sees them, and so he's honest with God about the issue here, about what happened. Now, no, notice what he moves into where he ascends and confident here on E is where we are, or verses 18 to 26. He, he's, he's coming back out of this, so he's going to recite, right? He's going to confidently recite some things that are true. And the very first thing he's going to do is restore the connection between God's righteousness and his sovereignty. He's going to restore the connection between God's righteousness and his sovereignty, And he's going to give us a view from above, right? He's going to look down from God's perspective. Now, here's the things he's going to affirm, okay? And these are, these are did any of you have uh, your parents who used a little phrase from Scripture? Be sure your sins will find you out, right? Be sure your sins will find you out. And the only way that that's true is if there's a God in heaven who sees everything, right? And it's a warning, right, to say that there's no sin that's ultimately private. God sees everything. He sees to the depth of your soul. He sees what you do in private. There's no sin that's ultimately private. Also, not only does God see it, but every sin that we're engaged in will affect the public you when you meet other people. So the things that we struggle with is shaping the way we interact with other people. If we're hiding things, if we're viewing the person wrongly because of private habits, right? All those kinds of things are here. So he restores the connection between God's righteousness and sovereignty. So verse 18, truly you set them in slippery places. You make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away by terrors. Like a dream when one awakes, O Lord, when you rouse yourself, you despise them as phantoms. Here's what he wants to say. God does see. God does know what someone is doing and will respond as justice demands. 
He's the sovereign ruler who is just and brings justice. Because right in these to myself, right, when he looks at the wicked, wicked like a bad dream when one awakes, when God surely brings justice, the smirks will be wiped from their faces. Their arrogant tongues will be silenced. No riches will save them. No army can defend them. No public opinion will dissuade God. God will not care if everyone told them that they were on the right side of history or if their followers slam him on social media or if the so-called experts back up their life and choices. God and God alone is the standard of what is good and right. God will uphold what is right and promote what is good and God will judge all. And that is unjust and evil, right? That's the claim. That all will stand. And so we make decisions on the long term. We make decisions from the fact that everything is in God's sight and God will hold us accountable. But notice then what he says here. He reasserts that God didn't move, right, in verses 21 to 26. He did, right? Now here's here's one of the things that's so counter to what we normally experience here. Notice here, Asaph, the psalmist, never plays the victim card. He never steps off into, well, you don't know what kind of wife I'm married to. If you had the wife that I am, you'd understand why I'm in despair, right? You don't understand the chaos in my family. If you had the chaos in the family that I had, you'd understand why I'm just irritated and growly and, you know, chew people's heads off or why I'm over here in a fetal position depressed. You don't understand what I, guy I have to work with at my work. You don't understand the struggles that you don't understand what my parents did to me when I was growing up. You don't understand, right, all these kind of things like that. He doesn't play that card. He assumes, right, in, the, in this thing, that he has responsibility for what he's let his feelings do. Okay? Your feelings are going to respond to events. You have control over where you let them go. Right? And the feelings themselves are windows to your soul, but you have a responsibility to determine where you let them go. Right? You can get angry with something and chew somebody's head off. You can get angry and not chew their head off. I mean, there's a lot of different things that can happen here, but he says, I didn't, God didn't move, I did. Right? So he shoulders the blame in verses 21 2. When my soul was embittered, when I pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Okay? He doesn't explain it away as that, oh, it was just a bad day. You know, I didn't get enough sleep. You know, the baby was up three times last night. And so, honey, or I was hangry. So, you know, let me apologize for how I chewed your head off the last five minutes, right? All those kind of things like that. He doesn't take that. It's my responsibility. I was irrational. I was behaving like I'd lost my mind. And, and, and that's just what I did. I was just like a beast. So it's his fault. He took, it took place because he did not bring God's presence, character, and power to bear on his experience. It was as if animal reacting by instinct. He was irrational. And he takes full responsibility for it. I don't know if you've ever had a moment like that. I have. Now, some of them I've shared with you, they're, they're embarrassing moments, right? Well, all of a sudden, it's like you lose your mind, then you come to your mind, and one I'll never forget, and I know I've shared it with you before, is uh, uh, one of my dogs did something that shouldn't uh, have done, right, at least in my estimation, and I was out there yelling and going at that dog, and my wife and my four girls were standing at the door looking at me like, you just changed into the Incredible Hulk. What happened to you, Dad? I still remember, Daddy. Daddy, and I'm looking at myself like, what just happened to me? you scary. Right? Now, I don't know if you've done that, right? Some, you can use it in anger. You can lose it in despair, right? Every man here who's got caught up in some sort of lustful activity, all of a sudden, you, you lose your mind. You forget about what really matters and where you are, and all of a sudden, you're swept into a world, and then you recover out of it. You feel guilty and dirty and, and debauched. That's the idea here. But he doesn't say, oh, man, if I just had a better roommate or if I just had nicer people in my life or if I had more money or if I just had people to treat me better or if I had a different history. He doesn't say any of those things. He just says, no, I just lost my mind. And he assumes that we have the responsibility and the capability to steward our own emotions. Right? And this is one of the things when people come back, that's just the way I am. What, you're just a person that just blows up and chews up people? No. Right? So we have responsibility for those, and so he takes responsibility. And then he reflects on God's loyal love. And there's four things here that he goes after. We won't have time to go through them in detail. 
because I want to wrap up with a couple lessons. So he looks at his sustaining presence, verse 23. God is with him, for him. He's there to guide him in trouble. God's presence is sustaining presence, right? A faith thing is to say, when I turn to look to God, he's there, right? Second, his guidance to glory, right? In verse 24, his guidance to glory. And I think this is twofold. In the Old Testament, it doesn't talk a lot about uh, a future hope, right, in terms of beyond the grave. But I think this is twofold, is that God, if you listen to him and you turn to him and reckon on his presence, he will guide you through the circumstance so that you grow and you're blessed and you bless other people, right? We've all seen this happen where somebody who's faced a real tragedy has turned from it and walked through it in such a way that has inspired all of us to trust in God. And that's what he's talking about here. And then, ver- and then verse 25, his incomparability. He's incomparable, right? He's the highest good that earth and heaven have to offer. He's the highest good. God is the treasure. God is the treasure. And if you have him, you have everything. And then fourthly, his sufficiency. His sufficiency. God is what we need. And if life gets boiled down, right? We, we sang about it. This is the story of Job. Though he, remember Job, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. If everything gets wiped away, if I have God, I have everything. Right? Now that's, that's a faith statement. So he ends with his affirmation. Says, God will punish all wickedness and genuine prosperity. God will punish all wickedness and genuine prosperity is found in drawing near to God. Drawing near to God. Now, I'm going to take three minutes here and I want to give you a couple things about faith. I want to give you a formula here at the end. So this isn't on your notes, so if you want to write this down, you might want to write it. Okay, it's, it's very complex math. Feelings, feelings minus faith, feelings minus faith equals foolishness. Feelings minus faith equals foolishness. So if you have a bitterness about how life is unfair, it can produce bitterness that in effect reduces one to a beast. They can't, you cannot follow your feelings blindly. Okay? Scripture does not deny tears, does not deny pain, but you can't let them take you apart from reflecting on God. Here's my second little formula. And this is the wisdom of the psalm. Feelings plus faith, feelings plus faith equal wisdom. Feelings plus faith equal wisdom. In God's providence, Scripture makes it very clear that in His providence, He lets times of real difficulty into our lives. Sometimes they come because of Him at at work in the person that we love that's next to us, and we get brought into it because we love them. God brings times of difficulty and injustice into our lives to strip us of things that don't matter. So here's what faith does in feelings. So faith puts God at the center of all satisfaction. You know, I've mentioned to you before, uh, one, of the, one of the struggles that I've often had is I'm dealing with a, 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 it's often a, a college-age girl, um, one of my daughters in the faith, and they're graduating from Cedarville, and they didn't think that they were going to graduate by themselves. Um, and they're a little upset about the way things have turned out, and they feel like they're not ready to walk out from Cedarville. They thought they were going to walk out with a hymn that they were going to share life together with, and their life plan is just not working out. And um, they joke about that at Cedarville and joke about that at college, but that's a, a, a genuine yearning for many people, and it doesn't, uh, that they want to walk together with a partner at some point in time. And they think, well, here's a lot of potential partners. It seems like a great place to get it. And I'm going to go from here to the barren wasteland on the other side. And so here I am, and I'm graduating, 
And that's not been realized, and I'm realizing that I'm a little fearful, and I'm a little anxious, and I'm a little upset, I'm a little disappointed. And in that moment, right, is where a person needs to say, okay, what do I do with this fear? What do I do with this anxiety? And my counsel to them is, all right, you've got to make sure that, that you've got to put God at the center of satisfaction. You've got to affirm to him that whatever happens, you've got to trust him. This is Elizabeth Elliot's old words. Is either if God's saying no, he could be saying not now, or he says I'm going to replace it with something better because that's all God does. He either says not now, or I'm going to replace it with something better. And so one of the things you want to do is you want to make sure that you stay close to Christ because if you don't, you'll wind up wanting him more than you want him. And I've seen that happen, right? And when you get in times of difficulty, if you don't put him at the center and say the only way to get through this is to talk to him, to listen to him, to look to him, to follow him, that's the only safe path to go. If you don't look at him, you'll follow some other savior out through it into destruction. So faith puts God to center. Second, faith brings God into the picture right? Faith brings him into the picture. This is where Psalms come in, where you just need to be reflecting daily on who God is and what he's up to. You need to be reminded because if you don't bring him into the picture, you'll be reduced to the vision from below and you'll get sucked up into something. But if you come to the creator of the heaven and the earth who has been faithful and who is faithful in blessing, and let me say the other side, he is faithful in judgment. I want, you to, I want you to write two verses under this, two verses, very important ones. I want you to write Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. Joshua chapter 6, verse 26. And 1 Kings 1634. 1 Kings 1634. Joshua 6 is Joshua saying, if anybody builds on this rubble that is Jericho, they will not only die, but their sons will die. First Kings is hundreds of years later when a person attempts to build on Jericho, and it happens. We don't think generations. We don't think millennia. We think today. Like I just sinned, nothing happened. I'm good. God doesn't think that way. Thirdly, faith takes responsibility for its actions. Faith takes responsibility for its actions. I want to say to you today, you're responsible for what you do with your feelings. You're responsible. This is why it's always been, it's been the truth within Western culture, as well as especially within Christianity, Nobody denies feelings. Nobody denies that you have sexual appetites. Nobody has, denies that you have an appetite for food or for success or for purpose or meaning. Nobody has any of those things like that. The question is, is you have a responsibility to steward those appetites. And they need to be kept within God's boundaries. So the issue is not that you struggle with, with, with desires for things. It's what you do with them. And Scripture says, no, you have the responsibility for your own blessing and for God's glory to keep them within God's prescribed boundaries. So you need to take responsibility for those and not blame them or use them as an excuse to step outside of God's will. And then fourthly, the last one, faith prepares for the dark, faith prepares for the dark by walking in the light. Faith prepares for the dark by walking in the light. I'm going to ask the, the music team to come up and what I want to say here at this moment my dad, my dad was a flashlight guy. Do any of you have dads that are flashlight guys? Right? My dad was a flashlight guy. I mean, there are flashlights all over our house. I mean, there are flashlights in his car, he had a, and every car had a flashlight, right? You had a flashlight uh, in, in the garage, sometimes multiple flashlights in the garage. Uh, in the utility closet in our house, you had flashlights, and therefore, we had batteries all over the place, right? We had, we, had a, we had a battery store. We, had even, we even went to the part where we got rechargeable batteries, right? So we had a recharging batteries. So we had this little battery station that was in our laundry room. 
And that was, you know, the hub for all of the flashlights put all over the house, right, in terms of that. My dad was always prepared for the house going dark. I don't know if that was a part of him growing up in a house without electricity or whatever it was that he had, but we always had flashlights. And so when I got married, right, what did my dad get me for Christmas? Flashlights. Right, so I got flashlights. I got flashlights. I got flashlights in the, in the drawer. And, I got fl- and right when Rana and I got married, it is my job to keep the flashlights working. Because if she gets a flashlight and it doesn't work, she doesn't go, oh, stinking flashlight, or try to do that. She says, Greg, wh- wh- why isn't this working? Right? And, and the, the, the point is, is that if you're not preparing for the dark, you're going to get swept into it. Right? And, and this is where your daily walk with the Lord your daily conversation with other people who have God's wisdom, you're staying in touch with the body of Christ, you're putting in practices in your life because the darkness is coming. Some of you are in the darkness and God is the resource to get us through it, right? Get us toward each other, toward Him in the middle of it. And so if you're not preparing for it, you'll be overtaken by it, right? So faith prepares for the dark.